So welcome to, um, to Anne and to Elizabeth and to Alex and to Rebecca and to anybody else who is watching this as we uh, talk about what we experienced and what we learned during our two months on the road through Nevada and California. And I'm gonna save the Nevada part to talk about separate because Rebecca and I and, and Christy and Deb have lots to talk about in terms of what did we learn and, and what are we continuing to learn from that. Um, so I will just share that it was a remarkable experience with remarkable humans and that it is an honor to continue to be able to play with those people, um, that we're all continuing to learn together and grow together. So um, Rebecca, do you have anything um, you would like to add to that quick synopsis? <laughs> If you nailed it. So extraordinary things are underway and will continue to uh, uh, people who are seeing their power to lead from the middle of one huge ecosystem and see the impact they're having and, and own that and all the possibilities that come with that. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was remarkable to watch them feel it and step into it and um, jump into, I'll do that. I'll take that one. I'll do that one. I'll take that one. I want to talk to that person. Um, I'll do it as soon as we're done with the meeting. I mean, that kind of thing. So it was just um, great, great energy coming out of, uh, out of those sessions and, and out of the work. So um, It was also nice to see that people elected to, to be there and elected to do those things. So that to me was really, really significant that, you know, you're in a governmental organization that's having a meeting, you know, it, it tends to be, you know, show up at the meeting and these people, it was totally up to them and they were there uh, enthusiastically with all the things that you were just saying, Kelby, but the fact that it was a, a choice on their part to participate. Yeah, it, it, it sort of bouncing off of that, many of the people who were in the room one of the conditions for success that we were creating is that um, the the folks at um, NDE, the Nevada Department of Education, really wanted the process to be as inclusive as possible, which meant that it wasn't just the team who had been working on stuff, but that the conversations were open to anybody who wanted to stop in at any point. And so it was... Um, an interesting facilitation to um, constantly be bringing people up to speed. But in, in light of what you just said, Dimitri, how many people just at two o'clock on day two said, I'm interested, I, I wanna know what's going on and yeah. showed up and participated and, and were actively participating in the conversation. Um, so that was um, really pretty exciting. One thing I'll share is, just, is the power when you have people who are real time in our um, immersion um, learning opportunities and simultaneously working real time through the framework on a huge effort. So you had people in the room who maybe were in the cohorts, people who didn't have really any experience with creating the future in catalytic thinking, yet continuing to point just like we do in class is this is any other day in your, in your office. Someone new joins the team. What conditions do you create on the fly for someone to feel comfortable? So the, them being able to start modeling catalytic thinking in action themselves and to facilitate ensuring so-and-so feels up to speed because the person who came in at two o'clock contributed meaningfully, had context to the whole, in a, just by someone taking a few minutes to get them up to speed. So I, I just, you know, we talk about playing with this in your real life. So for them to be real time, putting catalytic thinking on steroids on something with immense ripples and, and their, their um, agency and their ownership of all of this um, was, yeah. is remarkable. And I look forward to more opportunities that we can be walking alongside people real time in the stuff they want to accomplish. Um, modeling, teaching, facilitating, supporting, and, and just sitting back and smiling also as it happens. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty, pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable. So um, what I thought I would do is um, I've, I've collected thoughts under major themes 
and um, I'm going to be blogging on those themes. It was interesting to try to figure out how to blog this because so much happened. And in each individual meeting, so much happened. And how those meetings and interactions and, and talks leveraged others and may have related to something that happened two weeks earlier with a completely different group. Um, but, and how do you blog that? And how do you pull that all together? So it took several weeks of playing with it, playing with it, playing with it to figure out just some key themes that I wanted to share with you guys. And um, Shiva, jump in because you were such a big part of, of this um, as, as you experienced it in your, your perspectives. Um, the, the first and most important, and, and I will also say that none of these will be surprising to you all being part of Creating the Future. Um, None of these were big shocks to us. Some of, some of them were, were surprising, but surprising in a good way. And, oh, yeah, that good thing happens. Um, but um, none of these were big shockers, but so much of it confirmed um, what uh, each of us has experienced with, with using catalytic thinking, what each of us has experienced in engaging folks in um, in community action, and um, and that was, if nothing else, very affirming. Um, so the first one is that um, human connection is what's going to change the world. Um, if I was not convinced of this before, the theme that kept coming out of our conversations over and over and over again is that change happens in people's living rooms. Um, it, it happens with individuals having individual conversations and that that ripples into organizations, but that that's where it starts, that's where it, it catches flame and, and that the nurturing of those human connections is the single most important thing that we can be doing. And, and if we got nothing else out of the tour, um, when we took a look, I don't know if you guys can see, let me see if I can point with right there. There is a list in three columns, four columns, um, of the people that we engaged with, the people we had conversations with. Um, and that's not counting, I did a talk to 300 people. Uh, that's counting the number of individual conversations I wound up having. And it was over a hundred. It was over a hundred meaningful conversations with humans. Um, that, that's remarkable. And so the, the real um, deep reiteration that the importance is, um, I've already been blogging, get out of the office and go talk to people. In real time, in person, Zoom is fabulous and human connection is, is priceless. And, um, you know, that, that, that really was just so hammered home, uh, the need to, to be um, out having those conversations. Um, you know, we talk so much about to trust people, you need to know people, and you can know people via Zoom, and we know what it's like to build trust in that way. Um, it was pretty wonderful to see people that um, I know online primarily. Um, Shiva, you and I had never met in person. Um, Alex was on our board for like three years uh, uh, before we finally met Alex, and that was about two years ago, and had never met Rebecca. Um, got to see friends. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about Christine Egger. Christine and I met on Twitter in 2008. I think the first time we met in person was 2010. We saw each other again in 2015. We saw each other. Um, she, she came to a party that Shiva had for us, um, wound up coming to one of the classes that I taught at Berkeley, and just the ability to be face-to-face -face with somebody that I see online all the time. Um, it makes a huge difference. It just makes a huge difference. And our figuring out ways to make that happen, um, that became really, really evident. That, that we need to see and touch people. That, that, that is 
that is the most important thing. <clears throat> yeah, I was thinking a lot about a conversation that um, Rebecca and I wound up having with somebody after um, after the trip. Um, and it was it was just one of our fellows talking about how she could get more involved in creating the futures work and. Um, she was talking about a meeting that she facilitated for her local United Way. And United Way had packed it full. It was a, a new group that was coming together. And so United Way felt that they needed to, that the people needed to walk away feeling they had gotten value out of the meeting. So it needed to be stuffed with lots of stuff. And the one thing that became evident halfway through and that the person we were talking to said she completely lamented is that there was no space for getting to know each other. And that this was a group that was going to be working together for the next couple of years on a project and that the United Way had felt so much that the way people will get value, the way they'll feel they got value is if they take home takeaways. Um, and, and so if there is any sort of um, shift that we can make in the way that people interact in meetings, in, in what they expect. Um, the huge importance of that human connection was probably the single biggest theme that came out of everything. And, and it showed up in, showed up in a couple of places. I'm going to be blogging about this, but it showed up in a couple of places that, um, that were surprising. And the two of them had to do with animals. One of them was uh, on the last couple of days of the trip, we were in San Diego with Troy and we wound up going to an aquarium there. And I don't generally love aquariums. To me, it's, you know, that's a pretty fish. That's a pretty fish. Okay, I'm done. And aquariums just don't do me anything until Troy said, um, and they've got a section where you can pet the sea creatures. And I was like, okay, um, you, you could have started with that and I would have been right there. And they have a section of the aquarium where you roll your sleeves up, put your hands in, and you can pet a sea cucumber. And you can put your fingers in and let an anemone nibble at your fingers and try and, and, and get to you. And that connection that suddenly I not only cared about the aquarium, I wanted to see every creature and I wanted to know about them. And I didn't, and, and normally those things just bore the life out of me. And it was that connection, that, that ability to, to touch. And by the way, a sea cucumber is soft. A sea cucumber is soft like velvet. It was the most amazing thing, the most amazing thing. And, and, that was that connection, that, that touching, being with that thing. I wasn't looking through glass. I wasn't, I, and from that point on, everything I saw was exciting and amazing. And I wanted to know what it felt like. And um, the, the, the other one that was similar to that is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, the work that Joel Sartori has been doing on what he calls the photo arc. Um, this is a project that he, Joel is a National Geographic photographer of, for decades. And when his wife got cancer, um, he could not travel. He needed to stay home. And as she started to heal, uh, in order to be out in the animal world, he started to visit the local zoo and started to take portraits of the animals in the zoo. And what he realized is that one of the reasons that we don't care about animals going extinct is we don't know them. So again, to care about something, we need to know them on a personal level. And so the, the photo arc is the photo equivalent of Noah's Ark. He is intent on taking portraits of every species on the planet. And I think he's got 12,000 in the can already or some, some ridiculous number like that. It's primarily in preserves and zoos, but in some cases it's out in the wild. And what he's doing is portraits. So when you see these images, they're looking into the camera at you, just like a portrait would be. And what he said, we, got a, an, a, we had the ability to, um, to see an exhibit of this when we were in LA and listen to the video and listen to his words, which I've heard before, 
which is in order to save something, we first have to love it. We first have to care about it. And it just came back to, we can talk, we talk all the time about species and about loss of habitat. We were always talking about the stuff. And, and when we could see that face to face, and it just, it was such a, a remarkable metaphor to me uh, in very real time that it, it is about that connection. But that's, that is the most important thing. So, so if there were an overarching theme, it was that. It was, it was that human connection, that, that, that touching people. Um, any thoughts before I, I move on? Let me see if there was anything else to... Um, that One of the other thoughts uh, in, in that regard, Helvi, is the um, desire to share uh, that, you know, so many of the people that in many cases, you know, it's sort of like learning there's a JFK University, you know, finding that there's something that, that you didn't know. You start, you meet people there, and because it's a face-to-face -face conversation, because it's, it's connected, and because there is a connection that happens, mm -hmm. they want to share. And so they want to share their friends and they want to share their ideas and they want to share whatever on, on a really accelerated, in an accelerated way. I mean, not that it doesn't happen in this context, it does. But it was just, uh, it was really interesting to me that someone you met 10 minutes ago in reality was saying, but you also have to talk to so-and-so or, or so-and-so would be really interested in this. Yeah. Uh, I found that really, really powerful. And, yeah. and you know, so just to sort of add to what you were saying there on the, on the connection. Yeah, yeah, it really does put it on steroids. Mm -hmm. it, it really does, which is um, pretty remarkable. And, and what's, what's interesting about it is that you can have an hour and a half conversation like this, um, and you can have a five minute conversation in real time, in real touching, being in, in proximity to people. And um, the, the difference is palpable. This is great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm grateful to this. We are a global organization. We're going to have to depend on this. But um, that, that smelling, touching, feeling is, is, um, is irreplaceable. So um, the, the second sort of related thing to that, and it relates uh, very much to what you were saying, Dimitri, is um, that we already know everybody we need to know. Um, because everybody we need to know already knows everybody we need to know and that that ripples. Um, and one of the things that I was smiling at for years as I have taught community engagement, um, I have taught that the first thing people say is, well, I don't really know anybody. And several of the people that we reached out to who are our fellows and our friends in California so, well, I'm not sure I know the kinds of people that you will want to meet, um, which makes a million assumptions about the kinds of people we will want to meet. Um, but it was, it was so remarkable. One, one person in particular um, absolutely said, I'm, you know, I, I don't know those people. I haven't, I haven't lived here. I've only lived here four or five years. Um, I moved from across the country and I just, uh, one of the best connections I had was with that one person that she connected me to. She said, well, you know, this, this might be, it was brilliant. It was, it was a person doing, uh, leading an organization in LA that's doing capacity building that is starting to wonder about what it would take to shift capacity building to systems change. And she and I just exploded on each other. And this was somebody that um, when, when initially Gail said, well, I don't really know anybody, um, this might be a connection. And it was one of the best connections, one of the most enlivening conversations um, that I had. And so the fact that we already know everybody we need to know, um, is Shiva, the people that you introduced me to and the ripples from that, um, I've got one meeting this week and another meeting at the end of the month um, with two people I met through the conference at JFK University. And it's not as if I said, Shiva, I need you to get me a keynote. No, you introduced me to just somebody who was wise and brilliant and you said, 
you know what? I think you and Alvin would really get along. And A, Alvin is one of the most delightful humans I've ever met in my life. Um, and his wife, Yvonne, is one of the most interesting. I, I was blown away by her path and her story. Um, him introducing me to Solomon, who well, happened to be leading a conference two weeks from then. And these were individuals who came up to me after I talked. Um, one of them is um, a foundation, a, a, a corporate foundation person who wants to talk to me about um, talking to a group of corporate foundations. Um, it, it, and, and again, it's not because I said, Shiva, I need you to find me a person who does, which is the whole, I don't think these are the people that you want to meet. It's like, I want you to meet people who are interesting. And um, it, it so drove home that we already know everybody that we need to know. Um, and so that was, um, that was a beautiful lesson. Um, and, and really carries forward coming home and having one of the big goals of this year be to um, expand our ripples and to find partners for this work, um, to take everything that we did last year and leverage that into partners. There is just something very grounding in saying, you know what, we already know everybody we need to know. Um, and so that feels, that feels very delightful. It is very different from the, we need to do prospect research and call people prospects and yet that, yet that, yet just, it wipes it all off the table and says, you know, somebody who I think you might find interesting. It's like, yes, I want interesting people in my life. Um, so that was another big piece, another really, really big piece. Um, Shiva, I'm wondering if from, from the folks that you introduced us to, um, if, if you've had any ripples from that, if, if anyone has um, mentioned anything or said anything or... Sorry, I'm trying to unmute. Um, I haven't, you know, I, we're getting together with Alvin and Yvonne this weekend. And I will ask, I will just sort of casually bring it up and see what he says, what he has heard. Uh, but I really haven't seen, you. I mean, I introduced you to George and Alvin and Joyce. Uh, the last, I think I told you, Joyce was talking about wanting to do a project with you for PG&E. I don't know where that has gone, whether she's contacted you on it or not, but that was as of, I say about three weeks ago, that's what she was talking about. So, um, so that's all I've heard. Um, but not and not much beyond. But I also haven't gone and asked people either. I haven't contacted people. Sure. sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And and you've been in puppy land. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the puppy twilight zone. More more like it. It's more like. <laughs> oh, I do get that. It's like having a newborn. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Well, it was it was it was pretty remarkable and. Um, and yeah, yeah, just just the ability to to follow up with some of those folks, um, and and you never know, and you just never know. And that that was such the lesson, such the lesson, because in every case, um, the conversations that Shiva introduced me to with people, um, that Anne introduced me to with people, none of them were with any intention other than. This is an interesting person, and I think you two will have an interesting conversation. And and that was pretty remarkable. That was pretty remarkable. Um, probably a third big piece was how much the world has changed attitudinally in the past. I'm not even going to say two years because the past two years we know. Um, but in the past five years, maybe six years, um, when Dimitri and I first started changing the way we were doing our consulting way, way back, um, there was skepticism. There was, um, yeah, maybe skepticism is the best word of, of is this real? Is it, you know, uh, do we really need this? Do we, there is such a hunger right now for the conversation that creating the future is sparking. Um, 
the keynote that I did, I was the after lunch speaker, which is the put them to sleep. I could have stripped down naked and nobody would have noticed speaker. And these were 300 people who were sitting up in their chairs, eager for this. Um, there is a, there is a hunger for making a difference, a hunger for um, for how can I make a difference, and how can my work and who I am in the world make a difference that was not there five years ago. Um, and and having been doing this work in some form or another for 20 years, watching the evolution of how people are thinking about this. Um, there's a craving for this now where 10 years ago, certainly, and maybe even five years ago, there was, well, that sounds interesting. Very, very scholarly, very, very sort of superficial. And people are like, give me more. I want more. Where can I get more? Um, that, that's, that is a really important shift. Um, and, you know, you couple that with, as Rebecca was saying, the, uh, the eagerness of the folks at um, the Nevada Department of Education to jump in and lead from the middle. is like people want to know, what can I do in my life that's going to make a difference? And, um, you know, that was palpable at ND. Absolutely palpable. Um, but it was also palpable just about everywhere we went. Um, and, and it's, again, it's, it's the change happens in people's living rooms. Uh, one person in Fresno, he is 35 years old. He's a chef. He owns a breakfast place. And he opened his breakfast place at 6 o'clock at night, um, made little cinnamon toast squares and coffee for everybody. Oof, we lost Laura. Um, and and at six o'clock at night, invited his friends, and just we had a conversation, and and the fact that a he cared enough and wanted to, and he's not in the social change arena, um, he is not anywhere near. He owns a restaurant, and he has friends. He's very very civically aware. He's very conscious. Um, but the most important thing was having the conversation. And, and I don't imagine, I mean, I know, we were, we were trying to have these conversations years ago. It was not happening among a restaurant owner. It was happening among nonprofits and community change people. And here it was happening everywhere. It was happening everywhere. So that was pretty remarkable. That was pretty remarkable. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I, what I was gonna say is a big, huge piece of that is the eagerness among young people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and young, I mean below 40. I mean millennials. Um, and those who are, I guess they're now calling them Generation Z. I, don't, I can't keep up with the labels. Um, but um, kids who are in college, um, who are no longer being labeled millennials, but the millennials now are all in, um, they're all married and having babies. And, um, the the hunger the 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 one thing that was and and I think that this is another big theme is that um, this is the second ripple I've seen in my lifetime of a generation that wants to change the world. Um, there was my generation, <laughs> generation Shiva's generation, um, and now this generation. And what happened with our generation, I am scared to death, although I'm not seeing it yet, is that um, we got married, we had kids, and we realized we needed to support them. And we went off and sold insurance and sold whatever because we couldn't be activists. There was no road for that. And this generation is very eager to keep fighting the good fight. And, and that, I'm taking that as a very serious responsibility to provide them with the tools that mm -hmm. keep them going. Um, because if they, lose, if they lose track and lose sight like our generation did and suddenly come back when you're retired and have the time and you've already spent your life 
we need them now. We need, the, we need all of that energy, that entire generation's energy right now. And making sure that they're not taking the route of, well, I got to support my family, so I guess I can't be an activist. Um, there's there's got to be a way that we can support those two things together. Um, so so that's another big, big piece of, of what was very, very clear. The conversations generationally were fascinating. Um, one of the, the most interesting things, because there were a lot of people who were in that millennial um, sort of age range in a lot of the conversations, whether they were in workshops and, and conferences, whether they were in one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, there were just as many people our age, um, our age meaning me and, me and Dimitri's age. And the difference that we found is that the millennial generation isn't yet tied to, well, this is the way I've always done it. This is, this is how, you know, this is what I've found works. There, there's not a lot of finger wagging and not a lot of, of I'm the expert and I've lived my life. And, um, and, and while we didn't get a lot of that in people our age, when we did get it, it was people our age. And when we met with skepticism of any kind, and I use skepticism sort of loosely, um, among folks who were younger, it was from an eagerness to know place. Um, it was from a, this isn't connecting for me, show me how this connects. I want to understand this. Um, it wasn't from a pushing back place. And when we did get that, um, yeah, I, I don't think so. It was consistently from people our age. And like I said, it wasn't a lot, but it was just so interesting, the difference in, in the approach. Some of that has to do with life. Some of that has to do with the fact that by the time you're 60, you figure you know everything. Um, and when you're 35, you're um, not as convinced that you know everything. Now, teenagers know everything, and we know that for a fact, but <laughs> they, they outgrow that. Um, and by the time they're 35, they don't, they're, they're still willing to learn, which is, um, which again for us is a message that if there's a place that we're going to play if there's a place where we're going to nurture it has to be that generation that is both eager to make a difference still trying to do it even though they've got babies um and and is is really really eager to learn really really open to learn so that was another big big lesson for me dimitri you started to say something did i did i complete it or uh, I was actually going in a slightly different direction, and that is I've watched the language change in the last 20 years, the, la the language that people use. And, and to me, my, my sort of litmus test of that is community benefit organizations. Now, I know that that's not specifically uh, uh, in the catalytic thinking um, 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 language set, but it is a way of, of looking at what we do and what we all do. And this is a particular sector that, ha that is now very comfortable with, that, with the phrase community benefit organization, much more comfortable than they ever were. And uh, I remember the first few times that you would talk about it, that there would be just these light bulbs go off. Really? You know, I don't have to say I'm a nonprofit. You know, I could say I'm a community benefit. And then by simply defining it as community and benefit, you change so much in terms of how people uh, react. So I've seen that arc change to the point where, you know, in Fresno, the, the, the university there uh, uses that language, uh, and, or at least the community I saw is using that language in a much more um, um, sort of natural, ubiquitous way. Uh, uh, not that nonprofit has disappeared, but I just thought it was amazing to see how easy it is to say that phrase without someone saying, what are you talking about? Uh, and so that's been one of the other changes that I've seen on, on, a, on a more sort of meta scale. Yeah. Yeah, well, Fresno State has adopted the community benefit organization language um, throughout absolutely all of its programming. And so every student coming out of Fresno State 
in their programs is using that language and that ripples into the community, which is pretty awesome. Pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Um, the next big thing, again, a not a surprise to anybody in this group, but really worth sharing um, widely is that collective enoughness is everywhere. And that as Dimitri said, people are really eager to share what they have. And um, there were virtually no situations where we asked, there were three situations where we asked for money. Um, all three of them were um, where, well, there were actually four and in one of them we were told no and we did it anyway. Um, but they were all situations where we were presenting, we were doing something, we were doing a workshop or doing a, do, doing a, doing a thing. And, um, where it came from those individuals, um, and came from in the form of, well, what are you charging for that? And the ability for us to say, this is our mission. Um, and. Um, using that beautiful phrase that that Gail Valeriot brought to creating the future, which is um, pay us no more than you can afford and no less than you think it's worth. And that alone speaks of collective enoughness. That is, we value you, and if you value us and you want to provide compensation, that is that is a way of doing it. But other than that, every single thing was people sharing what they had and who they knew. Um, you know, Shiva, the trip could not have been possible without you and Brad welcoming us into your home. It, it absolutely could not have been possible. Um, Troy uh, was, Troy's house was, he was doing Airbnb. And he's no longer doing Airbnb, except he said, I'll sleep on the couch, take my bedroom. Um, that's collective enoughness. We're just not used to thinking of those as the assets that they are. Uh, we're so used to thinking of money and we're so not used to thinking of those as the assets they are. The, the example I kept talking about when we were with you, Shiva, and you and I talked about this a lot, is, um, we could have said, we're looking for somebody to come up with a couple thousand dollars so that we can spend two weeks in a hotel in the Bay Area. And we could have easily stayed in a hotel in the Bay Area if somebody had come up with a couple grand. The benefits, the, 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 I can't even begin to say the layers and layers of benefits of being in your home and having you guys around to talk with, to bounce things off of, to, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the day that you and I went into the city to meet with Rebecca Altman's team at Third Plateau and the ability for you and me to ride the train together and to chit chat together and to think about stuff on the way home and to talk on the porch afterwards. Those, you know, we would have gone our separate ways. I would have met you in the city. We would have, and, and there's just something really powerful when we're thinking about things to follow. Um, it just made so, so much of a difference in every single place. People shared meals, they shared meeting space. Um, and what was so interesting was because that was so much a part of the trip and we came to expect sort of that spirit of enoughness and abundance and, um, and making stuff happen. It was jarring when we met with scarcity. It was, it was absolutely jarring when we met with scarcity. Um, that fact alone is pretty cool. Um, you know, we, we live in a world that is rooted in scarcity. We, we work in a sector that is deeply rooted in scarcity. And to have us have spent two months interacting with all of those people and to have the scarcity be the anomaly that, that it, it surprised us when we came up against it, that's saying something. That's saying something. And, and it was because everybody, you, Shiva, Anne, the folks in LA, 
um, the, the beautiful people that we met in, in Lancaster outside of, of LA in, in Antelope Valley um, really came with that spirit of we'll pull this together and we'll make it work. And, and in the rare instances where we encountered scarcity, um, it colored absolutely everything. And it just, it made it, um, it made it uncomfortable for everybody. I mean, it was remarkable how uncomfortable it made it for absolutely everybody, including the person in scarcity, probably especially them. Um, but you could just feel the ripples of it. Everybody in that particular situation um, was quietly apologizing. Was, I mean, it was just the exact opposite of everything that we felt everywhere else. It was, um, it was pretty remarkable. It was pretty remarkable. And then you have um, a, a group that we met with that was so grateful that we stopped by and spent time with them. They have a $10,000 budget and donated $500 to creating the future. And that's the difference. And that's the difference. And, and you just, you felt it in everything. You felt it in absolutely everything. There was just joy in, it, it wasn't a transaction. It wasn't a, uh, well, you, you charge too much. Or it, it, there was none of that. Um, but yeah, it was pretty remarkable that, that living collective enoughness, the scarcity was absolutely um, shocking to the spirit. Um, and, and, and really colored everything. Um, in the interactions with 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 everybody and and others, yeah, it was um, it was pretty big, pretty big. Um, and and I think talks a lot to what it would be like if communities were rooted in collective enoughness. Um, I'm I'm thinking about the work that you and I have been talking about, Rebecca, of the stuff that you're doing in your community, um, and and. But when, when it's rooted in collective enoughness, it just changes the whole feeling of, of being with people. You, yeah, and you can feel it. You can sense it. Um, so so that's, that was pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, Shiva, I want to be mindful of your time. Are you still with us? Are you leave, wait, Tell me when you're leaving. I have, to, I have to leave in five minutes. I'm so sorry. I have this uh, doctor's appointment at 2.30 in Danville. So it's at least 20 minutes drive and then, you know, getting myself up. I um, get it. I am so thrilled to hear that, number one, this has been a positive experience. Number two. You're locking up. Um, I learned. Yeah. You, so, you, so it's it's, you, it's you wonderful that people because you locked up, and so we we didn't hear number two. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was saying it's wonderful that you have felt that this experience uh, not only opened some doors, but also opened some places in your mind and in Dimitri's mind and in creating the future's mind for thinking about what is important and what is working and who is the one who needs us and um, how can we go reaching out to those people. And, and you know, in, in some of the work that I remember when you and Anne and Rebecca and I and, and Laura were talking last year, a big part of that was about, um, you know, who, who will be there to listen? Who should we go uh, and talk to um, and, and what is it that we can bring to people and all of that. So I'm so glad that you made the decision to actually make this an in-person, you know, approach as opposed to a Zoom approach, which as you said is, you know, valued in itself and yet it's never the same. And, and I know Rebecca will attest to this. I've been saying this for years. It's like, are you guys going to have a conference? Are you going to have to bring people together? Are you going to do this? And are you going to do that? And, 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 you know, and by necessity, you haven't been able to do that. And yet it seems like there is now this extra incentive to feel like that is the way uh, that true connections are made and strong connections that can move forward. So I'm so, so thrilled to have been a part of that um, I'm sorry that I have to sort of bow out at this point and I will continue to follow you guys as time goes on 
and send an email from time to time and say, hey, tell me what's new and, and tell me all the good news that's happening on your end and all of that. I, w- I would want to know. And I've just been, you know, it's just been such a pleasure to be in these Zoom rooms with you, to have you guys be out here and do the work that you did. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping those ripples will continue because I really do believe that the work that you guys are doing is not only needed, but it's necessary at this point. It's absolutely necessary. So, thank you. So thrilled to have been with you. So sorry to I have to go, and and now I have to really go go. So. <laughs> uh, Shiva, thank before you. you run, tell Brad that I'd like to talk to him at some point. I very thank much you. enjoyed meeting. Very thank much enjoyed. You. Thank you. Thank you. I will. So, I will. Yeah, he's been he's been pretty busy. He's been going internationally and doing I know, I know, I know. Crazy stuff now. But yes, I was I certainly will let him know. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. All right, you guys. Sending you virtual hugs. Thank you. And just take care of yourselves and, and keep up the good work. Thanks, Shiva. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ah, pretty awesome. Um, the the next big thing um, is, and and we talked a lot about this as we were prepping. It became so clear that the goal of every conversation is to start a conversation. Um, you know, we keep saying the goal of engagement is engagement. Um, it's not engaging people so that. Um, and I remember when we first started having the conversations about engaging folks to eventually identify who might be partners down the road, that it was an interesting, it was interesting to watch people in those meetings have to constantly remind themselves, oh yeah, this is not about asking for money. And it was it was huge that the goal of engagement is to get people thinking is to start the conversation and the, and the conversation is going to go where the conversation is going to go and people are as as Dimitri said earlier they're going to offer what they offer and they're going to come up with stuff before you can ask anything before you can say is there somebody else you think that we should talk to they're probably going to have offered six people already um, and that was just, that was so, so, so clear um, that the goal is not to convince people of anything. The goal is not to get anything, but simply the goal of having a conversation to learn from that person, um, to have a sense of what you might want to learn from that person before you go in or not. Um, and, and that was so powerful. I'm thinking of several conversations. Um, I'm thinking of one in particular uh, with somebody who um, initially, after the conversation, we went, yeah, well, I, that was interesting. Um, he was massively interested in what we were doing, um, but didn't really have much to add, didn't really have much to, to talk about. And we left thinking, well, this is somebody who was interested, but I'm not sure where this is. Well, by two months later, I'm realizing that um, this person changed my language. This person changed my perspective on how we're talking about, um, we had been talking before about, and I'll give you a very concrete example. We'd been talking before about um, pulling together nonprofit resource centers and academics and anybody who teaches social enterprise and how to change the world. And, um, offering our classes to them as, as something that they can use in their work. And so whether it is the, uh, an association of, of nonprofits, a statewide association, or whether it is uh, like Fresno State used our class last year to, to teach their students. We've been talking about it in those terms. Um, this person said, um, so what it looks like you're really looking for is distribution channels. And I went, oh, yeah, I guess that is what we're looking for. And it was, it was, it didn't sink in until a month later. 
as I started to think about what we're looking to do next year and how we're looking to do it, that I found that language suddenly seeping into what I was saying. And so it, it, again, just the point of conversation being that we engage with people, we learn from them, we get something from them that, that gets our brains working. Um, that was really powerful. That, that was really, really powerful. Um, a lot of the rest of it has to do with um, logistics um, of what it takes to create an engagement effort. And I've done engagement efforts before. It's how we built the diaper banks. Um, but I've never spent two months on the road intentionally talking to people. And so the logistics of what that takes to have that kind of concerted effort. Um, Laura, you would be very happy. Dimitri and I sat down one night over dinner while we were on the trip. And we brainstormed the names of every single human we know and said, we need to start creating a spreadsheet. <laughs> so at least we have a spreadsheet. Um, just those, those very, very basic logistical pieces. Um, but what also became clear in the logistics, and I know that I've shared this with you guys, but I experienced it, was that we figure out how to talk about stuff by talking about it. And my language got a lot clearer by the end of the trip. That my ability to say who we are, what we're about, um, it, it was, and, and what was really fun is one of the last meetings that I had was a foundation in LA. And um, I had talked about the fact that um, our, our mission is sort of twofold, that one, it is to apply catalytic thinking and learn from those experiments. And then the other is to share what we learn. And um, this person asked, so talk to me a little bit about how you are sharing what you learn. And I know that three, four, five months ago, I would have been going in my head, okay, we've got this program and we've got that program and what do I talk about and how do I talk about it? And, and what just rolled off my tongue very, very quickly because I was comfortable was we are looking to, our mission is to share what we learn. And so any way you can think of to share what we learn, we're, we want to share it. And so, yeah, we do structured education programs and we bring people together in Facebook communities and we have got a million different and I can share those with you if you want. But we want to share, our mission is to share and we'll do anything it takes to. And I know that that would not have been my answer three, four months prior. That I would have been thinking, okay, what are our programs? How do we, and, and just, it's not because that's what the answer is. It's what the answer happened to be that moment. But it's because I felt comfortable. And that the only way to feel comfortable talking about it is to talk about it. Um, and that the first several times you're going to be clunky. You know, Rebecca, you and I talk about that in class all the time, that, that you know, when you're trying something new, it's going to be clunky. And um, so, uh, you know, would I love to go back to some of the people we had those initial conversations with and say, hey, wait a minute, now I'm really good at talking about this. Um, but that was, that was a big, um, that, that was a, a nice piece on the logistics side to remind us that we don't need to know what we're gonna say all the time, um, that, we, that you, you get better at talking about it by talking about it. Um, seeing what resonates, seeing what language rolls out of your mouth. Um, so that was, that was another big, big, big thing. Um, Very specific to creating the future's mission, there were several small bullet items. Um, and, and these are um, really narrow, really, really, really narrow in focus, really, really small. Um, one is that capacity builders want to be able to provide capacity for systems change and they don't know how. Um, and that that deeply resonates, that, that conversation is deeply resonating with people who are doing capacity building. Um, another is, um, 
the desperate need for changing systems in the social change arena. <clears throat> um, changing capacity building to focus on ends versus means. Um, changing the way funding is done. Ch changing the fact that academics teach um, management, but don't teach what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it. Um, that, that was another, another big piece. On the other hand, one thing that I have learned both in my conversations in Florida and my conversations on this tour is that there are academics who are teaching how to create change and we need to find them and, and, and have conversations with them. We need to learn from them. Um, and and that, was, that was pretty exciting to know that there are people out there that are teaching how to, how to change the world. Um, and it's sublimated under the, the management stuff. So you can get a degree in nonprofit management, but you can take a class in how to change the world. Yeah. How do we flip that? How do we flip that? Um, there's a big piece in there about systems change and the difference between what has consistently been thought of as systems change versus what we're talking about. Because people, who have been focused on systems change for a long time are thinking of it in terms of legislative advocacy um, and it's coming from a problem solving place. So when people say they're doing systems change work, they are frequently trying to change stuff within the existing system and using that language and using that reactivity and, and just so if we could shift it so that instead of this homeless program, we had this homeless program. Instead of saying, we want systems change that is creating an equitable community. And so those, the, the, it is a, it, it's our need to be clear in terms of what we're really talking about when it comes to systems change, because there's a language out there um, in, in the advocacy world in terms of what they're assuming systems change is. And um, a lot of, um, yeah, we're already doing that. Um, so that was, that was really interesting to me to, to be with people who are doing systems change work, um, and what they're thinking of as, as systems change and what we're, we're thinking of. Um, one of the, one of the most interesting things that I did was, um, we arrived in, um, a small community where an individual organization had asked us if we would do a workshop for their people. And um, when we arrived, it was right before the Thanksgiving holidays. They were having a lot of trouble finding people who wanted to, on a, like a Tuesday before Thanksgiving, who wanted to, to get together and asked if we would do something just for their board and their organization. And of course, we were happy to do that. And when we asked, what would you like us to talk about? Um, she said, I'd really like you to talk about sustainability. And I'm thinking, okay, I haven't done a sustainability workshop in probably five years. Um, and it was, I'll share with you, I went back to Pollyanna and pulled up Pollyanna and I said, what did I used to teach? How did I use to? Oh yeah, this is how I used to teach it. And it was really fun to do that through the lens of collective enoughness and through the lens of catalytic thinking and how we talk about things now. And to realize that at the it only and stuck stages, and even at the I'll try something new stages of people who are looking just to be more effective at the work that they're doing, that we have stuff that we can build. Um, and, and so that was really interesting to me because I, I've sort of set aside all of my old nonprofit consulting stuff, um, focusing so much on developing catalytic thinking and how we teach catalytic thinking that now it's, it was really fun to go back and apply that and to say, oh yeah, this definitely fits. Um, so it, it'll, it'll be fun to play with that. Not anytime soon, we got a lot to do, but it'll be, it'll be really fun to be able to play with that. Um, and the last thing that I learned 
is that uh, when one is planning an engagement effort like this, that the most important thing is self-care because there were no conditions for my success. Um, and uh, there is the tendency for people when, uh, when you're going to be in community to want to take advantage of that. And, oh, you're going to be here? Um, would you do this? Would you have dinner with this person? And would you, and, and you want to say yes. And um, my knowing that I'm not good at dinner time because I'm up at 4.30 in the morning. And so if you want to have a dinner engagement, I'm probably not going to be my best. Um, I need downtime. I need, okay, so that's, that makes it personal to me. But I think for anybody who is embarking on a concerted community engagement effort like this, because this is really what this was. This was a massive community engagement effort. For anybody embarking on something like this, understanding um, the personal needs and the personal conditions for success for the individual humans who are doing the engaging, I think is absolutely critical. Um, and uh, again, we pay absolutely no attention to that. I, I love the fact that, that Beth Cantor is starting to talk about that. And because Beth is Beth and has the audience she has, that people are starting to have that conversation. But it is so critical. And we do not, um, in, in standard organizations, we do not talk about the success of humans, uh, of the human. What does each individual human need to do, be their best to do that work? Um, it's why I'm even more excited about the organizational structure that we're contemplating that is rather than your job is to serve the organization, that the organization's job is to make sure you have what you need to succeed. Um, because we don't ask that question, and I didn't ask that question, and I was fried by the end. I was fried by the end. And so um, th that, that to me is, is a really big logistical thing for anybody that is contemplating doing this. And I can't recommend enough that people do this. Um, it was th the benefits. It, it, I am sure if I were to write this six months from now, I would have a list twice as long, three times as long as we start to, to think about the various ripples and things that are that are happening. Um, I'm getting calls and contacts from students that were in the classes I taught at Berkeley. Not just from the professors, but from the students that were in the classes. I had one uh, young woman who I've already had an hour and a half phone conversation with, um, who was a student in one of the classes. So absolutely, the, the benefit of doing this is, is ridiculously amazing um, but really knowing that it's humans that are going to be doing this and and making sure those humans have what they need and I believe that is what I've got anything you would add Dimitri and any comments that that you guys have Rebecca and Laura I, I, the, the one comment I want to make in terms of uh, the very instant case of students contacting you is this is a different message and and they, you know, certainly in an academic environment, uh, there is a, you know, this is the way we do it sort of mindset, because that's how you teach people things, you know, this is what you're being taught, this is the way we do it. And most of what creating the future and catalytic thinking is teaching is a very different way of doing it. And so there is a, a, um, a button that's potentially pressed in people to go whoa wait a minute what was that you know that that was really different you know they we, you don't lose it in the noise of of similarity uh that is uh, so common so i think that that's a, a real powerful part of this effort and, and that the message is a different message and well i that, think I, I i'm i'm gonna yes and and the yes and the and is that there is so much to learn that people don't know about every single cause that is out there. And that because we're so used to talking in sound bites, that somebody from a food bank talking about the ripples of what goes on when you're really living in poverty and what that's really like and what life is really like, 
um, having the aha effect on people who have their preconceptions about, um, well, if only those people would, and if only, and if only, and if only, that um, our message, yeah, we, you know, our mission is to be weird and wacky, is to experiment with stuff and, and to try stuff. But engagement is about having conversations and getting people to go, I never thought of that. And, uh, you know, you and I experienced that with the diaper bank. It's not that the diaper bank was, was that different. We were another poverty organization. And we happened to be dealing with diapers. The, the ahas that people had when we were talking about diapers were not about diapers. They were about what it's like to live in poverty. And so I think that it is about finding your voice and finding the things that people don't know that you wish they knew and, and finding the way to express that because engagement is engagement. And, and I really strongly believe that if people with any mission did what you and I just got done doing, that they would have similar responses, that they would be getting those phone calls. They would be getting the, if they were teaching, if they were talking to a class, they would be getting students that would be calling them because it's understanding that, um, you know, what does it take to get through the noise is get people thinking. And, and so I think that that's a really, really critical point. Yeah. What, what stands out to you guys, Rebecca and Laura, as, as I've been babbling here for an hour? Well, two things, there's more than two, but two things. One around, you know, you said that this was a massive community engagement effort. And I think if people start to see their individual life as an opportunity to be a life of massive community engagement, like as a steady state in their life, what could that make possible? If, if I'm choosing to be my mission about community, I am choosing to be engaged with my community and I can shape and define that as today I'm going to define my community as you know, what the next door neighbor who's lived there seven years and we just wave. I'm taking that as my mission today. Tomorrow, my mission in community engagement is you know, whatever it is, I'm going to the grocery store. So on my way to the grocery store, I am committing my community engagement effort to be every single human being that I see in there, whether they see me or not, I see them and then what will be my choice around community engagement. So I think for people to see in very bite-sized chunks our potentials for community engagement to be our personal missions, however we are defining that community in that moment and you know however big up down wherever you're comfortable to start playing then the world will incrementally be a more humane place and getting back to the thing we've been talking about of the sharing and the documenting and you know and the other thing you spoke of around the language is I think all of us are finding some language that's more comfy to start talking about this when I was at my sister's surprise birthday party of course everyone asks you the question what are you of, doing? yeah <laughs> and then it's our choice on what we do with that question. So being able to talk in ways, um, you know, with people I did not know at all even, or people who are like, yeah, your sister still doesn't, you know, when I ask her what you're up to, you know, whatever kind of crassy kind of sarcastic comment my sister some may make about, you know, it, or other days she can be nice about it. Yet every single time people were erupting and saying, this needs to be here. I see this over here, like there's because it's the practical application, and that really comes from playing with talking about what is it that really speaks to you in all of this. You know, when we talk, like you said, about the systems change, when we can talk about <laughs> your family is a system, what are the cultural norms when dad walks in the door? What's the cause and effect of that? Now what? So. I think down at the individual level to see the big tour and the big out there yep, and for people to see self in a little bite-sized chunk of what is my power to lead from the middle of me and my life and my, however I see my community in this moment. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sparking on how many conversations um, we wound up having on the tour in people's living rooms. 
those were individual humans engaging with their friends and and you could just as easily have somebody over for dinner and have a conversation or have a conversation in the laundromat or have a i mean yeah i love every word you just said <laughs> How about you, Laura? What's standing out to you? Um, I you, think you, who were the keeper of our sunflower. <laughs> um, you know, in in all the, I was jotting down some of the things you said when you were talking about the different themes that you're going to be revisiting and writing about and talking about and integrating, and I see. Um, a through thread, I think, about, you know, it started when you were talking about, um, you know, the power of that in-person connection to humans in a room together and acknowledging that it feels different than a Zoom connection. And, um, and then going through to um, all the way through to talking about, you know, uh, we learn how to talk about things be by talking about them. We don't really know, we don't need necessarily know what we're going to talk about until we talk about it over and over and over again. And, and the way I put those things together in thinking about creating the future as an organization and as a collective of people is... Um, I wrote down, you know, how might we organize an in-person retreat for every Creating the Future colleague um, to give the opportunity to gather in that way because that is something I've heard over and over since the um, in-person weeks went away is, yes, and I miss that. Um, and I know that every, there are so many ways that, that, each and every one of you have worked to maintain, you know, create those, those opportunities for people. And, and when you were talking today about the collective enoughness piece, I mean, I think it would, I think it can be easier than I had been thinking to put those opportunities out there and make them happen. If we put it to the community and, and it could be, um, I, I'm having so many ideas now, even about, um, I belong to this, well, I've been off Facebook for a month, but when I was on Facebook, I was on in a vegan Facebook group, and they have, and it's across the country, around the world actually, but they have um, so many people saying, we want to meet each other, we want to, you know, have dinner together, um, so they have ambassadors in the towns in whatever city, and then those people are responsible for connecting people. So, you know, something as simple as, I mean, that's not necessarily simple to put together, but the idea that we have what we need to make those personal connections. So what can we do to that, to, to have that happen? And then thinking about, you know, we, we don't talk, Figuring out what we need by talking about it is really jumped out at me um, as far as creating the database or a database or a place is um, it's something that we all need, all know we need. And um, I want to start somewhere and I feel like we can ser serve the or serve each of us better and faster if we start doing something now um yeah. and even if it's like here's the big pile of bits of paper here laura you hold them you know so just like get somehow get things something rolling even if it then in a in a week we're like oh well that was a good start and let's go this way um so that idea that because i've been thinking oh my gosh we we haven't met for so long. We have to do all this research about all this stuff and figure out what's been done and who's this. And, and you know, hearing you talk, I'm like, oh, yeah, mm -mm. <laughs> we, we can start now. We have what we need or we'll get it. Um, so 
that idea of like, what's the smallest amount we can do right now that will serve us uh, to make those connections happen faster and easier. Um, so kind of, just, um, I don't know, I just think of it as instead of going all the way down the road, like, let's just start <laughs> something. Um, and that it's also the, uh, the last piece that came to mind when you were talking about the self care and how you were tired by the end, you were burnt out. Um, I think about like, I think Dimitri and I talked about it a little bit, even before you left when I was there for a couple of those days and, and we were talking, um, just about how different people are, are in different situations and acknowledging that, um, you know, oh, I think it, Dimitri commented something about, you know, do, do you think of Hildy as a, as an introvert? Um, because, you know, basically saying, well, she is, and she needs that space and that time, and, and you express concern, you know, to, to that, uh, that, and, um, and it's hard to know in advance what you're going to experience. And I remember thinking at the time, like, oh, right. I mean, that's part of what I do as a professional and as it, part of my passion is helping people create that space. And so again, part of that collective enoughness, you helped me remember that that is another space I can play in with you. And, and it could be, codified for anyone who is planning any kind of engagement um, but that idea that you um, I can uh, it's another place I can step in and say hey we can create this so that you come out of this actually uh, energized and thriving instead of depleted and tired um, yes. and I, I think that there's a lot to um, communicate to the world about that really yeah yeah it is it is something i'm really mindful of when i'm home and uh and have way better control of my schedule and in this case there were times where in the morning i didn't know that in the afternoon i was going to have something and mm -hmm. um and how do you how do you not you're a thousand miles from home how do you not take advantage of that um right and um, yeah, and and so having um, having some sort of systems that um, yeah, I, I just love what you're saying. It's a systems that it doesn't it, it, it's not a system for Hildy, but it's a system for uh, here's some questions that you can ask that will lead you to X um, mm -hmm. if you're going to be embarking on an engagement effort because if somebody's doing engagement in their home community one of the issues that's going to arise for them that didn't arise for me is that they're there and so uh if the conversation gets exciting somebody can say oh can we have lunch next week mm -hmm. and and you're thinking well i don't want to lose momentum and this is somebody that's really important to the work that we're doing and yeah i'll have lunch next week where you know i could say mm, yeah no won't be here um, mm -hmm but I was going to be somewhere else that was going to demand it of me. But I mean, I, I think, I think that we're, that, that you're really hitting on something there that could be powerful for people um, because it is a piece of this that nobody talks about. So I'm, I'm excited by what you're saying. Systems and questions, systems and questions. <laughs> uh, anything else standing out to you all before we, um, before we take leave of each other. And I will encourage anybody who is watching the recording, um, I'm probably gonna post this into the blog. And so if you happen to happen upon it and you're watching the recording and uh, have some comments, leave them in the blog and we will, we will play with them. And especially those of you who couldn't be with us today, Shiva for the rest of it and um, Anne and Elizabeth and Alex and Rebecca and I am, uh, I could not be more grateful to each and every one of you for making this happen. So, I thank you all. Bye. Take care.